Um, the first major force to arrive in, in Ireland uh, arrived in early May 1169 on the Battle of Ireland. Um, and it is always striking that according to one of the main um, proper, uh, one of the main sources we have in particular, the um, uh, so my mind is just blanked on <laughs> Gerald Scaberensis, sorry. Um, the the numbers involved in this in these initial Norman incursions, if you will, are actually remarkably small. Um, this first uh, group consists of no more than 30 knights. 60 um, armoured men, 20 foot men, and 300 archers. So the numbers involved are very, very small. The other thing to remember about the, the invasion, I think, is that it is not in any way systematic. Um, there are, from the very beginning, there are really strong um, rivalries uh, and elements of competition between the various Norman lords who are engaged um, in, in the conquest. Uh, and there are really, and there is no real sense in which you can view the Normans arriving in Ireland as a strictly unified military force whose primary objective is the conquest of the whole country. What happens is a much more piecemeal process. Um, I need to confess at this point that I mentioned from my connections with our club, in terms of military activity, I had the pleasure, um, shortly before getting my job to Glasgow, of working as a researcher on the Irish Battlefields Project. Where I, which was jointly run by Enaclan, uh, a Trinity-based history company, and Rubicon Heritage, an archaeology society, um, society uh, sorry, an archaeology company. Um, and my job was essentially to do research on um, the early medieval and high medieval battles. Uh, my job finished about 1300, 1350. I was hired, I suspect, as a sort of a tame historian. Uh, and it's the kind of historian who spoke archaeology. My job was to go and do documentary research on battles and then to hand the research I carried out to various um, archaeological um, researchers who would then go into the field and actually look for concrete, tangible evidence of the battles. So sadly, I didn't get to leave the office at all during the entire process of, of uh, carrying out this, this, this study. One of the first major um, conflicts of this Norman invasion and Norman incursion, occurring around about the, the 5th or perhaps the 6th of May 1169, is the Battle of Wexford, about which of course Nicholas Furlong has written um, in, the, in the past. Um, this, we were talking this morning uh, as part of the question session about the, the um, the difficulties of disentangling Normans and Irish uh, and identities in this period. And I think it's quite appropriate that one of the first major conflicts of the, uh, of the Norman invasion is actually not a battle between Anglo-Normans and Irish at all. It's a battle in which um, the Irish forces, led by, uh, led by Dermot McMurray, and the newly arrived Anglo-Normans of, of, of Battle Island, actually attack a group of essentially Vikings, the Hiberno Norse population of Wexford. So right from the very beginning you've got this sort of confusion of military, um, of, of, of political identities and, is a, and, and a willingness to put to one side cultural identity for, for, for political gain and political objectives. Um, uh, this is one of my, it, it also is a nice example, I quite like the, the fact that it's um, it's a useful way of reminding you of how problematic many of the sources we have for the invasion actually are. I particu I'm particularly, I'm particularly fond of this quote from Geraldus Cambrensis, who describes a, a, a knight called Robert de Barry, who gets injured in the initial assault on the town of Wexford, where he was struck by a stone on his helmeted head, and he fell to the bottom of the ditch, and in the end just managed to escape by being pulled out by his fellow soldiers. And Gerardus then assures us that after an interval of 16 years, his molar teeth fell out as a result of the impact of the blow. And what is more amazing, the new ones grew in their place. Um, Gerald, uh, Gerardus Cambrensis uh, writes a wonderfully vivid account of the invasion. Um, but it is a wonderfully vivid account that was written at least 16 years after the events he describes and with an intense political agenda. Um, and that's something which we need to be aware of when we're thinking about these sources and using these sources. Later on, of course,
course, you get sort of the uh, the, the, the arrival at, at Bag and Ban of a force under Raymond Lebro. Again, a remarkably small group who arrive in mid-May the following year. And oh, by the um, <coughs> by the 16th century, it was this Bag and Bun group who seemed to have been regarded as, as the ones who sort of who were the, the chief kind of um, conquerors of Ireland. Uh, there's a record of a, 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 a two-line sort of poem, or, or again, at the creek of Bagindun, Ireland was lost and won. Um, and certainly this is reflected in local topography and, and place names as they were expressed in the, the, the 19th century, where you have a whole series of monuments on Bagindun Bagin Head, which are linked to, for example, you've got Strongbow's Cap, for example, referring to a, a stone in the area, various other features associated with the invasion in the popular imagination. Not necessarily genuine reflections of the archaeology of the period, but showing an ongoing tradition and ongoing memory of the invasion. Ultimately, of course, what you get is, the, is, the, is an incident at the Battle of Waterford um, on 25th August 1170, in the aftermath of which um, Strongbow, Richard de Clare, um, marries um, the daughter of, of Dermot McMurrah, and while well, the, the, the rights and wrongs of uh, the inheritance have been disputed, by virtue of this marriage he inherits the, the, the Lordship of Leinster. Um, the, the Normans were effectively here, here to stay. The motivations of the invasion are something I can't really discuss in detail, um, but it's uh, uh, the extent to which the Normans were aware as they initially sort of took um, Dermot's side that they were going to form a permanent presence in Ireland. Um, I think all we can say ultimately is that this is precisely what happened. I bothered sort of mentioning those three battles and those various groups who arrived to remind you that the process of conquest is not systematic. It's a piecemeal process and the settlement which follows on from that uh, piecemeal conquest is also piecemeal, is also very variable. The extent of settlement, the number of people who settle in a given area, the kinds of archaeology we associate with these settlements varies enormously 